Hello, and welcome to your first lecture on the judiciary or the court system in the United States. And when we're talking about the judiciary, we're talking about the court system, we're talking about both the Supreme Court and the federal court system. The uh, constitutional instructions tell the Supreme Court that it can create inferior courts um, at its discretion. So that's where the entirety of the federal court system comes from. But let's take a step back first and talk about judicial based law. So remember, we've been in this section of the class talking about um, different kinds of law, the law that is created by Congress or legislative law. Um, and last week, we talked about regulatory law, um, the regulations that the executive branch can issue in order to tell people how to follow the legislative law. And there's also a tradition of judicial based law, which is about the ways the courts have interpreted the law or interpreted the way the Constitution interacts with the law. And that is a, um, a function of judicial review, which we'll talk about later on. But first, I want us to think a little bit more broadly about the law um, as a whole, because law, it did not start, right, with the um, American founding, right? The whole context of law as a basis for society has existed for thousands of years. So how do we think about law in our system? And actually, that ha has an impact on our politics. So there's sort of two historical traditions in the way that um, Western democracies have thought about law and law's relationship to government and to politics. The first way is what's called civil law. And civil law is a comprehensive legal code that is created by the legislature, right? So the idea is, is that legislative law is designed to be as comprehensive as possible. And it gives little um, judicial discretion. Judges are deciding whether a situation um, fits into the existing comprehensive legal code into that legislative law or not. And if it doesn't, then they have to go back to the legislature and say, um, can you um, can you decide this question? And most of continental Europe is based on this process, right? I mean, the earliest one, the earliest sort of civil law code that we link to this um, in Europe is the Napoleonic Code, which was exactly this idea of it's a, a designed to be a comprehensive set of laws that cover every situation. Now, the other way to do this has been the common law tradition. And generally speaking, as you can see on this slide, generally speaking, this is England and all of her former colonies operate under this tradition. Now, common law works a little bit differently. Common law is meant to create a body of law through decisions. Now, what, what does that actually mean? Well, let me take you back, um, back to the Middle Ages to help you get a handle on why this might be. Um, the way England decided to do its law. So the idea was is that um, when you broke a law um, in the Middle Ages, you weren't so much breaking a written down law, you were doing something that was offensive to the king, right? And the king had to make a decision about, you know, are you, um, did you break the law or not? And so what would happen is the king would be the person who's the primary enforcer, right? The king is the primary judge, and the king would actually go around from place to place, particularly in England, um, and hold court, right? That's the whole idea of actually why we use those same, those words in the same, um, those two like different contexts that use the same word. So a law court and a court of a king, right? They're, that's why they come from the same root. And the idea is, is that the king made decisions. Well, um, King Henry II in the 14th century, 13th, 14th century, decided that he was going to try to come up with a more comprehensive set of rulings, right? And he also deputized people to judge for him, to be justices of the peace. In fact, that's what they were called. And the idea is, is that they would stand in for the king when the king couldn't be in every place to make decisions. But these were a body of decisions that were made in the name of the king. And those became what we call precedent. That's the common law. They hold the force of law because they are interpretations now of legislative law, but initially they were interpretations of the king's justice, right? And so the most important term for that is what we call stare decisis. Um, and that's a Latin term, and it means to stand on decided cases, to stand on precedent. 
And so this is what's going on whenever we watch a, um, a legal show. It's particularly obvious a lot of times in law and order in its various permutations, right? Because when they get to the law side of the equation, there's always like some junior attorney who comes in with their law book in their hand and they're like, well, in so-and-so v. so-and-so, they wrote, that's what is going on. They're looking for legal arguments based on the precedent of previous cases. And that common law tradition came through um, our founding process um, to create a common law in our system that's based on the interpretations of judicial um, of judicial legislation. Excuse me, let me say that again. That's based on the interpretation of legislation. So that's the, that's the idea behind how our law works. Now there's one little exception to this that I want to point out, and that is that 49 of the states law process operates under this common law situation as well. There's one um, state that has civil law as its foundational um, organization, and that's Louisiana. And Louisiana actually has several other sort of state level um, differences because uh, Louisiana was a French possession for so long. Their sort of internal traditions are based on their history as a French colony as opposed to being a British colony. So that's the idea here. That's what common law is. And so this, the, we also hear this talked about as case law. Um, it's the law of decided cases, stare decisis, standing on decisions. And it's the interpretation of law, constitutional, legislative, and administrative, and it's enforceable as law. And that's the important thing. That's why a court can decide whether or not the actions of a president are legal or not, why, the, why certain courts have um, put injunctions on actions of the uh, executive branch in every administration um, for the last hundred years, we can point to um, significant times when the court said no administration of whoever, you can't do that. Um, and so these interpretation of the laws are enforceable and are supposed to be enforceable and enforced as law. So the executive branch is actually um, obligated to enforce judicial decisions. Okay, so how does this whole process work? We're, you're going to see a, a video more about the processes of the Supreme Court, but let's talk about the federal court system in general, and we'll sort of build up to the Supreme Court. So the court system comes from Article 3, Section 1. And basically, the idea is that there is a set of jurisdictions for federal courts, and these are national laws, so any laws that are um, passed by Congress, right, those are under the jurisdiction of federal courts. And you can also see this a little bit in the idea of there are certain crimes that are both crimes under federal and state laws. So there are statutes in both national and state laws against things like murder or fraud. And depending on the particulars of the case, you can decide whether it is a supposed to be a prosecutor under state or federal jurisdiction. Um, but yes, yeah, so national laws are under the jurisdiction of federal courts. Federal questions, so questions about the relationship between the national government and the states or among the states, those are that's the jurisdiction of federal courts. The last one is called diversity of citizenship, which will make most sense in terms of an example. So let's say one of the students in this class is a um, citizen of Ohio, um, but wants to uh, file a lawsuit against another student in this class who is a citizen of the state of Indiana. Well, neither the Indiana or the Ohio state courts have jurisdiction over citizens of the other state. And so in this case, that would be a diversity of citizenship. And so if you wanted to file suit against someone in another state, that has to go through the federal court system. Okay, so there are a couple different types of federal courts. 
and we call these district courts and appeals courts. And I'm going to show you a graphic um, of how they're, they're laid out geographically in just a minute. But you need to understand the difference between these two kinds of courts. Now, one of the things that happens a lot is that it's, it's sort of unclear as a case moves through the system what kinds of decisions are being made. So at the, the very first entry level for courts, and this is true in the federal system as well as in the state systems, is something called a trial court. And in that trial court is where the questions of the case are decided. What happened? There are witnesses, right? A judge determines um, whether something occurred or it didn't, right? It's, so that's what a trial court is. It's that they make basic decisions about the facts of the case. And in the federal system, there are 94 districts. M many states have more than one district, right? In Ohio, we have two districts. Um, the federal court in the District of Southern Ohio is based here in Cincinnati, um, but what happens is that if you don't like the outcome of your case in a trial court, then you can appeal it, right? And we hear about that all the time, right? A person's going to appeal their, um, their sentence. They're going to appeal the court's decision. But here's the thing. In all cases, appeals courts, which are also called appellate courts, their job is to judge the case that happened, right? Never again, once that first trial court has happened, unless somebody gets a new trial, will the facts of the case be brought in to figure out who's telling the truth and who isn't. That's not what's going on. In appeals courts, at both the federal and the state level, what's going on is that the judges in appeals courts are judging the case. Did, did, was, did it go appropriately? Did the prosecutor do it, their job well? Was all the evidence obtained legally? That's all the kinds of stuff that can talk, get talked about in an appeals case. And in terms of the federal courts, there are 13 districts that are appeal appellate districts, and they judge a case. Um, and in fact, the 6th District Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit is here in Cincinnati as well. Now, in this, in the federal system, at the appellate level, cases are judged by a panel of three judges, three federal judges. So there's usually, there's usually hundreds of federal appeals court judges, but three of them get together to judge any particular case that comes to them on appeal. Once in a while, there will be an, an a decision of such great importance that the entire group of judges in that appeals district will issue what's called an unbank decision, which means that it was all of the judges together in that appeals district who decided um, to uphold the decision of the trial court or overturn the decision of the trial court. So this is what the sort of federal court system looks like in terms of a um, an organizational chart. So look, start over on the left-hand side, and you see there's the district courts, and then there are other kinds of federal courts too. So territorial court, court so Puerto Rico and Guam have their own federal courts. Then federal regulatory agencies actually have courts. And then tax court and bankruptcy court are part of the federal system. In fact, um, if you declare bankruptcy, it automatically goes to a bankruptcy court, which is a federal court. And all of those courts feed into the Court of Appeals, um, the Courts of Appeals in the districts. And then those Courts of Appeals can be appealed to the Supreme Court. And notice also there's some other stuff going on on the right-hand side. And these are, these are other kinds of courts that don't get a ton of... Um, they don't get a ton of news coverage, but they still have important um, impacts on what happens in our daily life. So the Court of International Trade, the Court of Federal Claims, meaning against the national government by citizens, and then the Court of Veterans Appeals, so people who are trying to get veterans benefits and things like that. And those are all... Um, uh, those are all encompassed by a, a, its own sort of court of appeals, which is the court of appeals for the federal district. All right, now here is a geographic representation of the federal court system. And so what you're seeing is that each state has its own court or its own federal district court, unless there is there are parts, parts of the state that are subdivided, right? So notice in Ohio, there's a district of Northern and Southern Ohio. The same is true in Indiana. In Kentucky, there's a Western Kentucky and an Eastern Kentucky, right? So this is an important thing to just to pay attention to um, because that matters based on where you or a business is in terms of that initial um, trial court ruling. 
And then also there are the um, the district appeals court. So, right, I said that Cincinnati is the um, home of the six district appeals courts, which covers Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Okay, that is how the federal court system is set up. Now, then the next sort of what happens next, right, is that if you're not happy with your result, either in a federal appeals court or at a state at a state supreme court, then you can try to appeal your um, your case to the U.S. Supreme Court. But the U.S. Supreme Court has a lot more intricate sort of um, uh, complicated processes by which it's decided whether a, a, a case will be heard or not. The next video you're going you're to see is about the selection of Supreme Court justices. And then after that, you're going to have a video about how the Supreme Court does its business, how it chooses cases, how it decides cases, and how that whole process works.